Hi there and welcome to my new video series. This series will cover key concepts of quantitative systematic reviews. I will be focusing throughout on quantitative research simply because of my own area of knowledge and experience. Of course the concept of a systematic review for qualitative research does exist and is sometimes called a qualitative evidence synthesis or QES. This video series will start by introducing you to what a systematic review is and then in subsequent videos I will look in depth at an actual published systematic review. We will also need to understand the statistics you will come across in the primary studies and we will also need to understand the statistics that is specific to a meta-analysis which is very often the last stage of a systematic review. In the final video I will be showing you how to use Revman which is a freely available software package to enable you to carry out a meta-analysis of your own. So let's start at the beginning. What is a systematic review and why is it important for them to be carried out? Like I've already said, I will be focusing on quantitative research involving numerical measures. Indeed, historically, systematic reviews had originally only been quantitative research studies addressing quantitative research questions. I want to start with a couple of definitions. This first one is from Boland et al, which is a key standard text and I'll be giving a list of all resources I recommend or consult at the end of this video. So according to Boland, a systematic review is a literature review that is designed to locate, appraise and synthesize the best available evidence relating to a specific research question in order to provide informative and evidence-based answers. In other words, it is some sort of synthesis or joining the results together of a number of primary studies that were all looking at the same topic and is performed in a transparent and repeatable way. This second definition I've taken from the Cochrane Review, also known as the Cochrane Library which is one of the world leaders in monitoring and guiding researchers through the systematic review process. This second key resource, specifically the Cochrane Handbook, will also feature heavily in this series of videos and should in your own reading also. It is freely available via their website and again I will give the reference at the end and I will place a link in the description below. So, according to Cochrane, Systematic reviews seek to collate evidence that fits pre-specified criteria in order to answer a specific research question. They aim to minimise bias by using explicit systematic methods documented in advance with a protocol. Now those two key words I have highlighted here are bias and protocol. The protocol will be your roadmap that you create to give yourself and your marker, publisher or reviewer a clear guide as to how you will carry out the systematic review. Bias, on the other hand, is likely to be present in any research to some degree. Where it is strongly suspected, it has the result of potentially undermining the validity, i.e. the truthfulness, of the papers that you review and you must therefore be alive to it in your reading but more about this later. It's worth seeing how systematic reviews lie against other kinds of review. A literature review is something you may have carried out before, perhaps in the final year of your undergraduate degree. You created your own research question, i.e. a focused topic you wish to review the current literature against. Then you extract themes, i.e. summaries of findings grouped together and finally write up an overview as to what extent your research question has a settled consensus or not. The book, Doing a Literature Review in Health and Social Care by Helen Aviard, which I will reference later, is useful in this regard and will still be very helpful for you moving towards a full systematic review. A systematic review, on the other hand, is a more focused type of literature review in that it is simply a deeper dive into the research question that you set up. Your searching of the literature is far more extensive and structured in terms of databases used and the thoroughness of the searches. Also, critical appraisal of your final set of promising papers is used as an important filter before extracting the results. And finally, 
and meta-analysis is often, but not always, the end point of a systematic review. It is where the results of those papers that survived your appraisal stage are effectively recombined or synthesised via a statistical process known as pooling. This produces a new, or rather an enhanced, set of results, but not created entirely from the results present in the papers already found, which can hopefully shed fresh light onto your original research question. Another way of discussing review that you may come across in the literature is to distinguish between a narrative review and a systematic review. A narrative review is used when a meta-analysis is not possible and so has all of the stages of a systematic review but does not end up with a meta-analysis. This can happen, for example, if you do not find sufficiently similar papers that address your particular research question. This is something that you will need to discuss with your supervisor when you are filtering down your papers as part of your critical appraisals. A systematic review, on the other hand, has passed the test, as it were, when papers found are sufficiently similar in design and variables measured. Now, I have found suggestions in the literature that a narrative review is a mode of offering your own opinion through selected use of literature. I do not necessarily agree with this, although I do acknowledge that in a narrative review there is the potential, and some might argue the necessity, for a more subjective approach. So why would you carry out a systematic review in the first place? Well, firstly there is the need to update the status of key medical evidence on a particular research question as there is often a certain level of discrepancies between competing research questions, we hope that through a systematic review, these can be resolved. And finally, through this process, we are at the very least expecting, or rather hope, to improve the precision and the value of estimates for current knowledge. So for example, existing papers with a small sample size will have large confidence intervals, which, to put it another way, have poor or low precision for the results they have measured. But by combining the data from several papers via pooling, then we should be able to arrive at a better estimate or a measure with a much higher precision, i.e. a smaller confidence interval. Now we must carry out a systematic review using our set protocol, i.e. in a systematic way, such that the whole process from beginning to end is repeatable. Let us now consider the complete journey of a systematic review. This may start with perhaps only a general or draft research question. For the plan of action to be undertaken, there are several ways of proceeding. So I am going to borrow extensively, although not exclusively, from Boland et al. 2017. So, guided by Boland, let's look in detail at the 10-step roadmap to your systematic review, which is taken from page 21 in the forward. I will discuss each of these steps in more detail, but for now, the steps are in order. Step 1. Planning your review. Step 2. Scoping searches, which lead to a review question, which therefore lead to writing your protocol. Step 3. Is your literature search. 4. Is screening the titles and abstracts and you'll do this via your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Five is obtaining the papers of potential interest. Six is filtering down that big list of papers down to full text papers of included studies. Step seven will be your data extraction. Eight will be a quality assessment, in other words, your critical appraisal using some sort of tool. Step nine is the analysis and subsequent synthesis leading to an interpretation of the results and finally step 10 will be to write up and disseminate your information. This will of course involve you arriving at some sort of conclusion. So in more detail step 1 planning your review. This is essentially thinking about your time management. Here you need to consider the size of the required review if doing this as part of your master's level study, in other words, considering any word count limits. Perhaps you can construct a study timetable in the light of any deadline and the amount of supervision that you will be given. 
The specialist software that you intend to use will depend on this type of systematic review you are carrying out. Is it qualitative or quantitative? Also, what does your supervisor recommend? Commonly, and indeed recommended by the Cochrane Review, is the use of the Review Manager software, otherwise known as RevMan. For the structure of your systematic review, are there other systematic reviews that you can hopefully look at, or perhaps you have a completely free hand? If you are free in this respect, then accessing a good book like Boland is even more important in my opinion. So, on to step two, identifying your review question and writing your protocol. So what is the general topic of interest for you? In other words, before settling on a precise research question, you might first carry out a scoping search, otherwise known as a scoping review where you can look at the state of research in a broad research field. To help with your scoping review search, you might use the PTC framework, which stands for Population, Concept and Context, as applied to your area of particular interest. From your reading in this area, you then finalise your review question, again checking with your supervisor. Then you write your review protocol. I want to explain here a little more about both the research question and the protocol. Now the outcome of a scoping review helps you to define your research question. When you do write your research or your review question, it can be helpful to be guided by the PICO structure for quantitative studies or the PEO structure which is generally used for qualitative studies. For PICO, it should be clear from your research question what each of the terms are. So P stands for the population, i.e. the patients, for example, of interest. I is the intervention, or for an observation study, the exposure. C is a comparison group, which may be a control group, i.e. a group of no intervention, or a placebo, or it may be the best current practice available. And finally we have O, the outcome, i.e. what measures are you interested in, e.g. recovery time, pain levels, wound area reduction, etc. For PEO, on the other hand, remember this is more used for a qualitative piece of research. P is once again the population or patient or even sometimes the problem of interest. E is the exposure, e.g. what is the disorder or pre-existing difficulties of the client. And O, once again, is the outcome. Now let me share with you some examples of PICO research questions. Number one. Is spironolactone a better drug for reducing the blood pressure of teenagers when compared to clonidine? So the population are the teenagers. The intervention is the use of spironolactone. The control is the use of clonidine, i.e. the comparison group. And the outcome is a blood pressure reduction. Second example. Is the intake of zinc pills more effective than vitamin C for preventing cold during winter for middle-aged women? Well, here the population are middle-aged women. The intervention is the use of zinc pills. The controlled comparison is the use of vitamin C instead. And the outcome is cold prevention during the winter months. And the last example is skin-to-skin -skin contact of the infant with the mother a more assured way of ensuring neonatal mortality when compared to drawing and wrapping. Now the population is neonatal infants, i.e. newborn babies up to the age of 28 days. The intervention is skin-to-skin -skin contact and the control or comparison group will have drying and wrapping instead and the outcome is measures of the mortality rates. Now just to offer a few examples of qualitative research titles using PEO for balance, I here have three more examples. So example one, what are the lived experiences of older people with colon cancer? So the population are older people. The exposure is their living with colon cancer and presumably their care in this respect. And the outcome is their experiences of daily living. The second example, what experiences do mothers returning to work and placing their infants in nurses report? Well here the population is clearly the mothers returning to work. The exposure is infants being placed in nursery 
and the outcome is the experiences of the mothers in relation to this. And for the last example, what are the attitudes of health professionals towards caring for older patients with dementia in an acute setting? Well, here the population are the health professionals working in an acute setting. The exposure is caring for older patients with dementia. And the outcome is the attitudes of these health professionals towards their older dementia patients. Now, example one was taken from the University Campus Suffolk website. Example two was taken from Boland et al. 2017. And the third example was taken from the Foley Library of the Gonzaga University, Spokane in Washington. In your reading, you may sometimes come across other variants of the PICO or PEO question structure. So, for example, D is sometimes added to PICO to mean design, e.g. E cross-sectional or cohort study, etc., forming PCOD. T is sometimes added to PICO, meaning the time frame, making it PCOT. Another variant of PICO is PCOS, where the two S's stand for study structure or study design. These variants of the PICO are more fashion over form, really, as PICO and PEO are still pretty much the staple approach. On the other hand, the ECLIPSE acronym addresses questions relating to health policy and management. This stands for expectation, what you want to find out, client group, who were you interested in, location, where was the study carried out or what is the area of concern, impact, what's changed as a result of the policy or management change, professionals, and finally, service. Also, I have come across two further acronyms addressing qualitative research. In addition to PEO, for qualitative research, we have PIO, where sometimes I, standing for interest, can replace the E for exposure, thus making it population interest outcome. And finally, there is the acronym SPIDER, used for qualitative evidence synthesis, where SPIDER stands for sample, phenomenon of interest, design, evaluation and research type. These last two are covered in Boland, Chapter 11. See page 200, table 11.3 for more details. Still on step two, I wanted to say a little bit more about protocol. A protocol is certainly needed if you intend to publish your systematic review. In which case, at the design stage, you must register your systematic review using the International Prospective Register of Systematic Reviews run by the National Institute for Health Research, the NIHR, which is housed on the University of York's website. This register is more commonly known as the Prospero Register, and I will put a link in the description below. So, according to Prospero, the protocol is a clear, well-justified and evidence plan that outlines the stages of the systematic review you intend to follow. OK, on to step three of our systematic review journey. This step is the literature search. If you've not already done this, now would be a good time to consult your university or college library in order to upskill yourself ahead of this crucial stage. You need to find out which are the most appropriate databases that you, you will need to access and here again your library specialist can certainly help you with this and alert you to ones which you may not have thought of. So whilst in nursing for example CINAHL is a key database it should certainly not be the only one you consult. In order to carry out a systematic and repeatable search you must first establish then refine your key search terms. Step 4 is now where you are faced with a big long list of potential papers which you need to start whittling down. There is generally some overlap of journals across the various databases so once you have your initial list of potentials which by the way you have simply collected from the titles alone you should then identify and remove any duplicates. After this you must consider with great care each of your remaining papers and screen them using your inclusion exclusion criteria. And it is at step four that you can really start constructing your Prisma flowchart. Now here's an example of a Prisma flowchart and you can see that it is a visualized description of the number of papers you initially found, 
and then after the various decisions you have made how these numbers will whittle down to the final number that you are actually using in your own systematic review. I will place a link in the description below that will take you to a downloadable blank template from the Prisma website so that you can make your own version for use in your dissertation. Next step, step five is where you obtain electronically wherever possible the full text papers of all potentially eligible articles. Note that I am not suggesting that you start printing any of these out unnecessarily as you are unlikely to keep them all. Next we have step six, selecting your final full text papers and here you might use a screening tool to assist you in deciding on only those full text papers that will be included in your review. This is a deeper level of screening compared to when you simply screen the titles and I will give an example of such a tool in the next slide. You are also likely to carry out an initial critical appraisal at this stage to finally remove any inappropriate papers or papers that are deemed to be too poor in quality. The completion of this stage will very likely allow you to complete your own Prisma flow diagram. Here is an example of a screening and selection tool taken from Boland et al. And what I want to show you is this greater level of consideration than we might have taken at the title and abstract stage. This slide is worth you pausing on as you can consider the thought that must go into your own inclusion and exclusion criteria for each item of the PCO as well as study design. On to step 7 and we have our data extraction for each paper. The next step, step 8, quality assessment, may be interchanged with this step in the ordering. However, I personally agree with the order given in Boland here as the process of extracting the data is a necessary component of critically appraising your remaining research papers. Now take care to only identify the data of direct significance to your research question. Many research papers will have secondary questions and associated data so be focused. In order to help with the data extraction, it is a good idea to create a data extraction form or table and this will then guide you to extract all and only that data that answers your own research question. Here is an example of a data extraction table taken from Zhang et al 2020 and again it might be worth pausing the video to see the level of detail given in a typical data extraction table. We'll be looking in greater detail at her systematic review in the next video. Step 8 is, in my opinion, the big one, the critical assessment of your papers. So, for each paper, you should first identify the design study, was it an RCT, a cohort study, a case control study, etc. Ensure that you select the best or most appropriate critical appraisal tool or tools to suit your review. Whichever tool you use, you must carry out a critical appraisal, i.e. a careful and systematic quality assessment using your chosen appraisal tool for each paper and use this to judge the strengths and weaknesses of each of your papers. Then you will tabulize and summarize your quality assessment. And let me say more about critical appraisal tools and how you can summarize your quality assessment. I want to highlight for you the more well-known critical appraisal tools available and here I am of course only picking out those for purely quantitative studies. Such tools also exist of course for qualitative studies and for mixed method studies. So first up we have the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool which has recently been updated and hence the acronym ROB2. This is what many consider the gold standard but it can be quite intimidating for the early researcher. The Critical Appraisal Skills Programme, or CASP, offers a series of checklists for quantitative and incidentally qualitative research papers. There are typically around 10 questions per list and I would say that these are far more user friendly if this is your first foray into critical appraisal of research. Next we have the Joanna Briggs Institute or JBI critical appraisal tool from the University of Adelaide in Australia. 
These have similarities to CASP checklists and again there are typically around 10 questions which are used to guide you to the appraisal of quantitative and qualitative studies. And the last one I'll mention here is the Robbins Eye, i.e. the risk of bias tool for non-randomised i.e. observational studies. This was also developed by the Cochrane Bias Methods Group. The links to all of these I will give in the description below but of course you must realise that there are other critical appraisal tools and as usual I would recommend you have a conversation with your thesis advisor about which is the best one for you. Here's an example showing one way of presenting a visual summary of the strength of your set of research papers post critical review. Here it has been presented as a risk of bias table and to make this the authors have used Cochrane's own risk of bias tool. Again this has been taken from the Zhang et al 2020 paper. This step of summarising potential bias is really well covered in chapter 8 of the Cochrane Handbook 2nd edition 2019. Having this visual table to hand will become very important once you are carrying out the final stage of a meta-analysis, particularly if you want to investigate such things as heterogeneity, but more about that in a later video. Nearly done now, step 9 is the process made so much easier these days of data analysis and synthesis, assuming that is that you have deemed your paper sufficiently robust to permit this last step otherwise you may be looking only at a narrative review. Anyway, if your data is deemed OK enough to be pooled in a meta-analysis, then this is the point where you input your data by using some software such as the RefMan program in order to combine the data using a statistical technique known as pooling in order to get an overall result that you can then interpret. I will go into way more detail for these steps in my final video in the series. For quantitative research, this will all commonly result in what is known as a forest plot. Here, for example, is the forest plot taken again from the Zhang et al. 2020 paper. A forest plot gives a summary, in tabulated form, of the primary papers that comprise your review. It will have the mean, or other statistical measures such as the odds ratio, etc., the standard deviation, i.e. the measure of spread of that statistic, the sample size for each group, a weighting percentage indicating how much each paper contributed to the final combined value, usually directly related to the sample sizes, and then the 95% confidence interval, which is a kind of measure of precision for these measures. Then on the right-hand side, you see a visualisation of all of this information. And here you can also see the sizes of the green squares and our reflection of the weighting for each paper. Also we are now given the overall pooled, i.e. combined value of the measure along with its 95% confidence interval. And this combined value is traditionally given as a diamond in the forest plot which can simultaneously give the mean value, in this case, plus its width as an expression of the 95% confidence interval. There is more information given in this plot, but again, I'll be saying more about this in future videos. OK, step 10, the final step. Of course, you have been writing and making notes as you go along and have hopefully been liaising with your supervisor throughout the writing process to ensure that you are on track. But once the meta-analysis is complete, you are now ready to finish the write-up of your dissertation. Now remember, the marker will only have your final written report to go on. They know nothing of your trials and tribulation of your research journey and so you must ensure that you are using the correct dissertation template if there is one. You must ensure the writing is as good a quality as possible and here again you might wish to consult student support services for reassurance that your writing is indeed up to scratch. And finally, make sure that this writing up part is not hurried. So you really need to plan your time so there is plenty of time for revisions, say as a result of feedback from your supervisor and a final proofreading. OK, there we have it, an overview of a systematic review. So I'm now going to end on some books that I would recommend to help you in understanding and carrying out a systematic review, for example, as part of your master's programme. I start with Ball in Detail from 2017, doing a systematic review, a student's guide. 
Although this is certainly not the only resource I recommend, I feel this is the Bible for any MSc student carrying out a systematic review. Chapter 1 should be read fully first as it talks about carrying out a systematic review as a master's thesis. And also a nice discussion takes place on page 5 where they talk frankly about the advantages as well as the disadvantages of carrying out a systematic review as a student. Next I have Helen Aviards doing a literature review in health and social care. I believe the latest edition is from 2018. This book is often used in the final year research module for nursing and other health related degrees. Many aspects of the concepts of carrying out a literature review transfer naturally over to a systematic review. So this is a gentle introduction to this aspect of your review. It also has the advantage of being very student friendly so I would place it high on my list of recommendations. Of course I mustn't ignore the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Intervention now in its second edition and this is the industry standard as it were. It is also available electronically and freely via their website. It is unsurprisingly detailed and complex at times but it is an important reference resource when you need more information than Boland offers. For example see chapter 10 of the Cochrane Handbook for a discussion around qualitative reviews. Although it is a little old now, I see this book by Edgar et al, Systematic Reviews in Healthcare, Meta-Analysis in Context, as exploring systematic reviews at a level which is somewhere in between Boland and the Cochrane Handbook. Next we have How to Read a Paper, The Basics of Evidence-Based Medicine and Healthcare by Tricia Greenhall. Now in its sixth edition, this is an excellent, readable and accessible book for undergraduates and new postgraduate students. There are helpful chapters covering qualitative and quantitative research. There are also useful chapters on searching databases and a very good chapter called Statistics for the Non-Statistician which gently handholds you to the basics of the relevant statistics that you will come across in research papers. And finally on my list of recommended texts is Medical Statistics Made Easy by Harris and Taylor. This is a very accessible and useful small reference book helping to demystify many of the concepts you will come across in statistics and their use in quantitative research paper. It is worth checking out as it will help you to both unpack the important jargon terms that you will come across as well as of course need to use to some extent yourself in your writing. And here are the books in Harvard reference form as well as references to other books and papers mentioned in the presentation. Ok so I hope you found this first video useful as an overview of what systematic reviews are all about. And I end with my usual disclaimer regarding any images I may have borrowed. Ok see you in the next one. Cheerio.